If you're just joining us, welcome to the Universal Design for Learning workshop. And I think what we can do today is um, we're just going to start with a couple of icebreakers since we have a good amount of people in this workshop. So I have enabled the whiteboard tools. So uh, towards the top of your screen, you should see something that looks like a little square with a T in it. That's a text box. And if you can click on that, um, you can type on the screen. I imagine many of you have probably heard of Universal Design for Learning, and I'm just curious what what that brings to mind for you. So just one word, what do you associate with Universal Design for Learning? Excellent. I see some interesting concepts here. Backwards design, it's definitely an instructional design technique. We first establish what's our end goal and then we work backwards from there. Inclusive, absolutely equity, methods, allowability. I'm not sure what that one means. Allowability was mine. I can explain it if you want. <laughs> I'd love to hear it. Yes, please. Um, so the way I view uh, universal design of any kind, but specifically for learning, is a lot of times learning and environments are designed to allow certain users. And so universal desi design for learning is expanding that allowability to include everyone. To, so we're allowing everyone to learn to their fullest potential. I love that. Thank you. I'm, I'm glad that's what you said. That's amazing. And it's definitely a big part of UDL so, strategy. This is great. OK. So I'm going to clear the clear the board. Sorry. If you have other ideas, you're welcome to type them in the text chat. OK. So hopefully I can just at least quickly get to know some of you. Um, if you want to type in the text chat, um, just know your name. Well, that'll pop up automatically as soon as you begin typing. But um, what is it that you teach? And what is it either that appeals to you about the universal design uh, for learning or, or about this workshop? Kind of open-ended, but just curious for some of your thoughts. Great, I see some things coming in here. You know, we've got some ideas here about just maintaining that student-centric focus, um, thinking about our course design because we're coming up on a brand new semester. So, you know, this is a good time for us to plan um, and make some some decisions about our courses. just staying current with teaching trends i like this yeah okay well no pressure we'll see what i can come up with for you today excellent 
Amy, I'm excited too. Um, it, it's been a long time since we've done a universal design for learning workshop. So um, I wanna make sure that we really do focus on some of these practical applications, not just the theory. Um, so I've got the agenda kind of up on the screen for you. On the left, you'll see it, the part about the practical strategies, uh, multiple means of representation, expression, and engagement. Those are kind of the three core principles of UDL. So um, you're gonna find strategies for that woven throughout the workshop. And then just specifically, um, I, I don't think I changed the order of my slides, but this is kind of what I have on the agenda for us is just developing that working definition of UDL, discussing what it is versus what it's not, some of the big questions that go with it. Um, and then I have some different ideas here as far as case studies go. So you can actually see what these might look like in different courses and different disciplines, as well as my top three tech tips for you, uh, because UDL is also about kind of this harmony with using technology in our classrooms to benefit our the learner experience. So no pressure, I think we can get through it all. So I did come up with a, a working definition of universal design for learning, and there are different uh, synopses for this. There are different summaries, but I think this is pretty much a, a good one sentence description for UDL. Um, so it is this idea that it's an educational framework that emphasizes uh, being proactive and intentional with the way we design our instructional materials, the way we design activities and assessments, um, and even the way that we use certain teaching strategies in our course. So we wanna be intentional with all of these things, both to engage our students, um, but also to meet their needs. And then I guess I would say that the second sentence that you see on the screen, that's more of the mission statement. And so it's this idea that all students, regardless of individual differences, should have equitable opportunities to access, participate in, and progress through the academic curriculum. So I think we said earlier some things like inclusion and allowability, absolutely. So these are all you know, key ideas here for universal design for learning. Okay, so what is it? What is universal design for learning in actual practice? So at the core of universal design for learning, it is this idea that everyone can learn and not just learn. It's this idea that everybody has the capacity to master certain concepts. So that's kind of that first button that you see there, that learners are capable. So this is, kind of a mindset. It's also embedded in how we speak and also in our behavior, which I'll get to in just a moment. It also assumes that if there is some type of a challenge or a barrier, then the issue resides in the environment. And that's a, a big thing with universal design for learning. Universal design for learning actually gets a lot of its principles from universal design for modern architecture. I don't know if you're aware of this or not. Um, so I, I just wanted to give you a quick example. For instance, we might have somebody and we'll say that individual is named Jane and Jane gets around in a wheelchair. According to the universal design principles for architecture, we would not say that Jane cannot access a store because her wheelchair cannot maneuver the aisles nor would we say that Jane cannot get in a building because her wheelchair cannot go up a flight of steps. The issue with one of those statements is that it kind of almost has a microaggression effect. It feels like the issue is with Jane and Jane's wheelchair. Instead, according to these universal design principles, we would actually change our kind of our perspective just a little bit and we would say, this building does not meet Jane's needs because it is not wheelchair accessible. Hopefully that, that resonates with you a little bit. 
So this is where kind of the universal design for learning comes from. We, we kind of stole some of those principles um, from this, this idea about architecture. So if our students are encountering problems or barriers, we're going to look at it as their issues with the current environment. Um, to go along with this, universal design for learning also says that learners vary. So my background is in English and I, I always saw a range of emotions when I would go to assign the first essay. I would say, we're gonna do a, a research essay and you're going to turn in a works cited page. And, and inevitably I, I could see just a whole bunch of different reactions from my students. There might be a few people who are like me and they were relieved because they had test anxiety and they would rather write an essay any day of the week. But that wasn't true of everybody. So we had different backgrounds. Um, I had some people who absolutely hated writing and I ruined their day just by telling them that. And then I had other students who were anxious because they felt that they didn't come from a background where writing was emphasized and, and this is actually one of their weaknesses. Or you might even have students who now were fearing the assignment. Maybe they were here on an academic scholarship and as fast as I said, write an essay, they were envisioning the scholarship slipping through their fingers. So universal design for learning acknowledges that learners are going to be different and they're going to have different skills, um, attitudes and backgrounds. And the other part that I wanted to touch on is that learners have preferences. So preferences are a little bit different um, than learning styles. I think that has largely um, kind of gone out of style. Students might have a preference for the way they, they like to learn. So you might have a student who's a music major. And so they said, you know, it makes more sense for me to watch a video or listen to a podcast or things of that nature. Um, but those are preferences and they could still learn by being exposed to other types of content in your course. Questions so far? Okay, so what is it not? What it What is universal design versus what is it not? So it's not a just in time or a time sensitive accommodation. So remember, if we go back to this idea about universal design uh, principles for modern architecture, if we were building um, this brand new store, we wouldn't wait for somebody to say they need a ramp and then build it. We would just initially design the the building structure with a ramp already included. So it's this idea that we're planning ahead, right? We're not waiting for somebody to say they need something to make that accommodation. When we have these um, ideas kind of cemented in our mind and we make that part of the initial, you know, course structure, we have the capacity to improve the course for everybody. So for instance, you may have a student who needs closed captions on a, on a video. Maybe they have um, an auditory disability. But if we don't wait for them to come forward and say that they need that, if we just put that into our course immediately, then somebody else who has one of those learning uh, preferences will also benefit from it. It's also not an appeal to change the academic rigor. So um, it's not where you're trying to change the curriculum for your students. And so I always like to use medical classes as my example for this, um, just because it sounds so life and death. But um, if you had a bunch of medical students in your course, presumably they wanted to become surgeons. If they didn't do well on the first exam, as an instructor, you wouldn't say, well, I think I can remove some of that content from the course. I mean, maybe they don't need it. Uh, that would never happen. So it's not an appeal to change your, your academic rigor, um, but it is this idea that what can I do in the future to help my students um, prepare for that exam? What can I change currently in my, my classroom setting? And it's also not catering to individual preferences. So even though we know that our students have these individual preferences, you know, maybe your music major really does resonate with 
you know, things like videos and podcasts and, you know, any, any type of interactive content like that. Um, you might include some of that in your course, but you're not going to explicitly try to convert everything in your course uh, into this audio format. So you are being aware of it and you're trying to incorporate elements, but um, again, it's not where you're going to spend all of your time trying to tailor a class to meet everybody's individual preferences. So as you go to design your course, maybe for the spring, um, so there's kind of the three big questions that you can ask yourself. Somebody had mentioned earlier on the slide that um, they thought about backwards design. That kind of speaks to this first question here. What do students need to master? Um, what do they absolutely have to learn in your course? What barriers could prevent that process? If you know what the barriers are, then you're going to be better equipped to come up with strategies to circumvent that. And then how can you design a course where students demonstrate their knowledge? Um, so that kind of goes back to maybe ideas about the flipped classroom environment, um, authentic assessments, this idea that, that students have to demonstrate their skills through some type of action or behavior. Okay, so I'll let you look at this for a moment here, but remember we had those three core principles that I had mentioned um, about UDL. So multiple means of representation, multiple means of expression, and multiple means of engagement. If you can incorporate these three types of, of content into your course, you're well on your way to embracing the UDL principles. So it gave just a kind of a bulleted list for each of those concepts, but by no means is this an exhaustive list. Right. So multiple means of representation, right? Just thinking about different ways that students can view their content. I think about this a lot, in, particularly in an online environment. You know, I don't want to look at everything as one big bulky uh, block of text. So I like to think about things like, do I have videos to watch? Are there visual images? Um, do I have different types of assignments? Interactive simulations, adaptive technology is kind of a new one here. So um, adaptive technology could even be um, e-readers. These could be um, voice to text options that students could use. And then multiple means of expression. So these are ideas of what you could do for assignments. Um, what can your students do um, to demonstrate their knowledge? And one of the things that I also like in the far right column here are the multiple means of engagement. So uh, as a grad student, I personally can attest, I love when I have a choice in topic. Even if there is maybe, you know, four different options and they say choose one. Um, that, that can be very helpful for me to engage and connect with my coursework. I also like it when my instructors ask, um, what type of feedback do you need from me? So, you know, sometimes I, I really have one aspect of a project that I'm working on that I really want their feedback on. Um, so if they ask that and, and I can tell them this is what I'm, I'm focused on. Um, I get a lot of value out of, out of their specific feedback. Okay, so I did promise um, I have some case studies for you. And I, I wanted to try to divide these up and look at the different disciplines here. So um, I think I have four of them. So this first one is actually uh, from an engineering course. Now, a lot of engineering students will tell you that they spend a significant amount of time in lectures um, and, and they learn about some of the bridge failures that have occurred throughout history. Uh, it's actually kind of awful, really, when you think about it. Um, when these structures collapse, they, they usually have mass tragedies involved. So instead, this is another way where you could incorporate some UDL principles 
You could ask students to work in groups to design and build a model bridge using everyday materials. You could really mix this up. Um, you could give different, different types of materials to each group, but um, each group is going to receive some instructions on the budget, the time limit, the specific design criteria. And, and we know that this is incorporating these universal design for learning principles because students get to uh, problem solve together, right? They're the ones maybe who get to select which building material they wanna use. Um, it's also gonna encourage collaboration, problem solving, and, and yes, diverse learning styles and preferences. Do I have any engineering instructors in here? I don't know. Okay. So I do have a case study, um, another one. And I'm, I'm just gonna give you a couple of case studies because I do have a, an activity for you here coming up. And this one's more for marketing, right? So students get to engage in a product launch simulation uh, where they create and market a new product. You also let students choose, you know, maybe from several different options. Um, you can provide some guidance on this, of course, uh, but how are they going to present their findings? Are they going to do written reports, visual presentations, multimedia pitches? Um, so there's a lot that you can do and play with here. You could ask students um, to choose what type of product they want to launch, or you could even ask students to pull from a hat, uh, maybe a different um, client base, right? So it emphasizes flexibility. Flexibility is a, a big, key idea with universal design for learning. Um, there's choice, there's varied means of expression. So um, these are all the, the universal design for learning principles um, in action. All right, so I've got two more for you. I, I tried to pull from some different disciplines here uh, because these are actual examples of UDL. So for a nutrition course, students have to take an exam. A lot of times we think of exams as being multiple choice exams. Um, so somebody was trying to figure out how to take an exam and turn it, you know, kind of into a, more of an interactive and engaging assessment. So they, they tried to make it more like a quiz show. So students get to engage with a variety of question formats, multiple choice, short answer, um, visual identification, you can have videos that play in the middle of a, of a quiz question. I don't know if anybody's ever used that or not, um, but that's another idea of just how to change up the, the standard multiple choice exam. So again, it's more inclusive. Uh, we're appealing to all different types of learning preferences. We're, we're doing different types of quiz questions. Okay, and uh, the last one before I turn, turn the mic over to all of you. There's a political science course and it's a policy analysis simulation. So again, you can come at this from a couple of different angles, but the idea here is that students are going to evaluate and present solutions to real world political challenges. Um, you could ask them to come up with their own solution, or you could ask them to go out and research some of the solutions that have been proposed. Um, but in either case, you know, students get to come up with a creative format to present their findings. Are they going to do a report, a presentation, um, et cetera, et cetera. And they get to kind of evaluate those, their findings. So again, you could have different um, formats. Not every group has to present their findings in the exact same way. So it's gonna be a little bit flexible and they're gonna look at different diverse resources and it does promote kind of this inclusive learning environment. So before I skip to the next slide, had anybody seen any of these types of case studies before? No, I haven't. Great. 
Okay. So I have two challenges for you and in the spirit of universal design for learning, you can kind of pick and choose whichever one appeals to you. Um, but there are two, two scenarios here. And I think these um, might be kind of common scenarios that, that we've come across in education, something a little bit familiar. So the first one is this idea that Sharon is concerned because her students did not perform well on her Roman history midterm exam. So although the students have attended her lectures and they performed reasonably well on their homework assignments, she says they did not come prepared for the test. So using universal design for learning principles, what could she do differently to prepare students for the final exam? So that's option A. Or if this one appeals to you more, we have Don who teaches a large enrollment biology course. So we're thinking over 100 students. And he wishes to incorporate an in-class learning exercise about the structure of a cell. But he struggles with developing these in-class activities due to the large roster. So how could he facilitate an interactive UDL exercise? So I'm going to leave it to you. What do you notice about these scenarios? What would you suggest? You know, these, these could be your colleagues. So you can type in the chat. You can come on the microphone. Um, your choice out. But let me know which one your which option appeals to you. Right. The, these are relevant scenarios. These happen all the time. Sometimes try as we might, our, our students don't perform as well as we think, or sometimes we're struggling with these giant classes and, and how do you make them engaging and interactive? So Amelia likes A. Do you have any suggestions for Sharon, Amelia? All right, I'm seeing some good things coming in here. I'm just reading the chat. So Amelia said maybe the final exam could be a presentation. Right, That's where students have to demonstrate their knowledge. All right. If they weren't prepared, then scaffold the exam questions into mini exams prior to the midterm. OK, I like these. Oh, I see a, a yellow dig suggestion here. Um, if you've never heard of yellow dig or if you have not used it, this is a discussion board tool that is um, based in uh, gamification principles. Students can kind of decide when and how often they want to participate to, to earn the max amount of points. So they could use yellow dig for real time discussions. Great. Chunking the information with students and looking at essential questions. Right. One of the things that I will tell you that stands out to me about option A is I hate when it happens as an instructor where I think my students are, are going to do well and then I'm shocked that the majority of them do not do well. Um, as an instructor, that, that's very difficult for me to to handle, you know, I, I was expecting them to do well, um, and, and I hate getting kind of blindsided by that. And so a couple of things that stand out to me is that Sharon might want to introduce um, some more check ins with her students throughout the course, establish that early on um, and, and just make that part of the routine. You know, what what did you learn from this lesson? What else um, do you have questions about? Um, and that might give her a little bit more of an indication before the midterm that they, they haven't grasped certain concepts. Nobody wants to feel blindsided. 
Also, you know, one of the other things I, I will mention here is going back to the universal design principles for architecture. Remember, the problem resides in the environment. The reason we say it, in, it resides with the environment is because we know that we have the capacity to change the environment. So um, she's saying that students didn't come prepared for the test. I think it would probably be more beneficial if Sharon kind of refocused and said, my class lectures did not prepare students for, for the exam. Um, and if she phrases it like that, then she, there's an opportunity to change the curriculum. OK, let's see about option B. I hear some option B happening in here. Michelle, you're, you're curious about the Don one. You've struggled with this, too. Large classrooms are, are difficult. So Katie suggested Don could have students work in small groups to build a model or to draw a diagram. I like it. Let's see. Group breakouts for discussion and mini present um, presentations. Yes. So, you know, option B, I guess you can also think about um, what type of modality are you teaching in, whether it's online or face to face. Um, but either way, you could still use breakout groups. Um, if you're in a physical classroom, uh, typically students are are open to to relocating or shifting and talking with their their neighbors. Uh, so I think that's an excellent idea here. Um, the idea, I think, is that in large courses, they're, they're always geared towards lectures. And is there an opportunity to, to reverse the roles and to ask students to, to present on their findings? Um, anyone have any suggestions for what's worked well for them for their large courses? Okay, seems quiet. So a lot of times you could ask students to, um, you could break them up into groups and, and ask each group to be responsible for one portion of the cell. Uh, that's another, that's another aspect I, I think that we maybe have not um, explored. But you know, this group is going to work on the, on the mitochondria, right? Um, so you can ask each of them to, to be responsible for, for one particular piece of knowledge. Um, sometimes the, the goal towards mastery is getting them to break it up into to manageable chunks. You've had groups of five and you had discussion questions, but it was a lot of work, even though the students liked it. It is a lot of work. Um, one of the things that I've noticed with large roster classes is um, students, um, you want to get them engaged, but you also have to think about what's manageable for you as the, the grading workflow. Um, so I often try to think of these as in-class learning exercises. What can we do together, even though um, we don't have to grade every single thing that you're doing? So hopefully that will help um, kind of ease some of the burden for you as an instructor. Because time management is crucial there. All right. So I have up here, this is, um, and I am, I'm not responsible for this, but I can send you the link um, to follow up with this in, in an email. But I, I do kind of like this chart. It talks about how do we actually implement universal design for learning um, principles in action. So at the core, we have those three main elements, right? The multiple forms of uh, expression, representation, and engagement. Those are the, the three big pieces of the universal design for learning. Uh, but they, they do talk about, so what does that look like? Um, so we often have to define the problem. What's the issue? Um, where is the conflict coming from? 
They do want you to be empathetic with your students, right? We want to take that, that very student-centric goal. Um, just keep reiterating, I, I know my students can, can succeed. I know they can master this content. You get to generate all of these ideas for what you could do in your class um, to help them. So we know that not all of our students have the exact same background. Um, students can come into your class with a wide range of um, skills, right? Prerequisite knowledge. Even though you wish you could go back in time and make sure that everybody got all of the assistance they needed, realistically, that's not feasible. But they're in your class now, um, so you can focus on, on the present. You know, what can I do in my class to make sure that everybody has access to this information? Um, what else can I help students with? Maybe maybe they need additional tutoring. Can you provide resources for that? Um, you know, do you have an optional folder of articles in case they need additional information? You know, things like that. So we always say to try to sketch out a design. I think this is kind of where you're at right now. You're already preparing for the spring semester. So um, as you're sketching out that design, you know, coming out with a prototype, what are you going to try to do differently um, this time around in your course? Think about the things that worked well and keep those components. Um, universal design for learning, I would also say is a cycle. It, it's ongoing. So, um, you know, keep the components that you thought worked well, um, and then also look at areas for improvement. The other idea here is to ask for user feedback. Um, this is a great idea. Just ask your students um, or, or even ask other people if you have time before your course goes live for feedback on your, on your new lesson plan. Um, did, did things work well for them? Were there parts that were confusing? Um, so getting that feedback is going to help you refine your own lesson plan. Reflection, that's another key part of UDL. This, this can happen as a result of implementing universal um, design for learning principles. So not only do we want students to be able to master these concepts, but hopefully by engaging them with their academics, uh, they can start to self-reflect. They can think about where they might also use these concepts that they've learned in your course. So that's kind of an end goal, but still um, just taking it beyond, um, I have to get through this assignment for my class, thinking um, where else this information is going to serve them. And of course, we always like to hear these success stories, kind of like those case studies. So share, share what worked, um, share it with your colleagues, share it with people who are in different disciplines. Uh, there's something that we can learn from everybody. And then it'll start the cycle again with, for your next lesson. Okay, so I did promise some tech strategies. So I know we're kind of shifting gears here. Um, UDL is very much kind of a symbiotic relationship with technology. It embraces technology, but we wanna make sure that technology is serving our students. It's not creating um, additional barriers. And so I have what I consider to be my top three tech strategies. You could leave this workshop today and, and you could go and probably implement some of these um, strategies in your course, which would help improve it. And that's always the goal, right? Perfection is not realistic, but improvement is always possible. So the first one is I, I would recommend utilizing Kaltura. So if any of you have lectures or videos, um, sometimes it can be tempting just to upload them directly to your Blackboard course. Maybe you just upload a, a PowerPoint that you narrate it. So the disadvantage to doing that is that there are no auto captions. So if you upload your video to NIU's video platform, Kaltura, it will just automatically auto caption your, your video right there, then on the spot. You don't have to wait for the DRC, um, it's done. You can also print out a text transcript and you have the ability uh, to go through the video and you can edit the auto captions to remove any typos. So if you're wondering how to do that, or maybe you're nervous, maybe maybe you don't know how to use Kaltura. If you think that it's a difficult or you know kind of confusing process, I'm here to assist. So following this workshop, I'm going to send out a list of resources. 
And in that list, I'm going to send you some links of uh, video tutorials on how to use Kaltura. So they're, they're brief videos. They're like five minutes or under. Um, but these are ones that I created. So it'll just kind of walk you through the steps. I promise it's nothing horribly complicated. I hope you haven't heard horror stories about it. Um, but that's a great way just to make a quick change to your course uh, that could benefit a lot of students. So. If somebody comes to you and says, oh, you know, I, I have an auditory um, disability and, and I need captions on my video, you could say, oh, they're already in place. So that's one way that I would uh, utilize technology that is at your fingertips. The other idea here is that you can check your Word documents. So, and I'm guilty of this myself. I oftentimes just go straight into my Word document and I think about how something looks visually on the page. So I might bold something or underline it. Um, these things work well for a lot of the population, but not for everybody. So if anybody is using an e-reader device, it doesn't at all detect any, any type of change in your font. So it doesn't know that you've changed colors, that you've typed something in all caps, uh, so instead, to get around that, you can use things like titles and headers on your Word documents. And I, I do have some screenshots that I'll pull up here in just a moment. Also, sometimes we like to use tables. Again, I'm guilty of this too. A, a table, a chart, it looks really nice, um, particularly in my syllabus. I might use the, a table or a chart, you know, because it has rows and columns that say this is the due date, um, this is the assignment, you know, this is the module it's located in. Um, but again, from an e-reader device, they cannot read those tables if they're not used for calculations. So uh, going back to that idea about having a flexible syllabus, you might just try to think about how you could use text only as, as one of the options for your syllabus. And then my third one here is to utilize Blackboard Ally. Has anybody played with Blackboard Ally? Just curious. Matsy, is that? It's great. OK, I've got some screenshots on this, too. Um, Blackboard Ally is built into all of your Blackboard courses, and it's only visible from the instructor perspective. So you don't have to worry that your students are, are seeing um, things that you don't want them to see in your course. But it tells you um, how your course is from an accessibility standpoint. And my goal for you is to at least utilize Blackboard Ally to make your syllabus 100% accessible. And, you might ask me, well, why my syllabus? Well, the syllabus is designed by somebody here at NIU, presumably you. Um, so this is a document that is fully in your control. Uh, that's a great place to start. Uh, it's gonna be the very first document, hopefully that your students read in your course. So sometimes as instructors, we do have to make, um, you know, some concessions. We, we have to negotiate a little bit, you know, Maybe I really want my students to read this article, but it's a PDF file and I can't change it. You know, it doesn't use headers and titles. Um, so it's not going to be accessible, but, you know, I want to use it because it contains valuable information. Oh, and it's a free resource, right? So I, I'm not making my students buy an expensive textbook. So, you know, sometimes we, we have to make those tough decisions, but with your syllabus, that is something that is fully within your power to change. So again, I, I like this idea of focusing on improvement. I would never tell you to use Blackboard Ally um, and say that your course must be 100% accessible. I, I just don't think that's realistic. Uh, but you could use it as a tool and say, today I'm going to improve one thing. And I'll show you a little bit what some of this looks like. So um, what does Blackboard Ally look like? So these are just um, some screenshots that I took in a Blackboard Ultra course, because I know we're all moving to Blackboard Ultra in the spring. So when you log into your course on the left-hand side, you'll kind of see some uh, different options and you're gonna scroll all the way down to books and tools. It has that little wrench icon. 
and then a window pane pops open and you have a whole bunch of different tools that you can utilize and it's actually the very top one and it'll say accessibility report. So this is actually, I have a sandbox. Um, it's not a real course, but we can pretend. And it gives me an accessibility score. Again, I can see it because I'm the teacher, not my students. So it seems pretty good. I mean, it's 95% accessible, but it still flags some areas where I could improve it. And so I could click on any of those little buttons, like fix the low scoring content or fix severe issues. Ooh. You know, um, and it could have um, a whole bunch of different things that need to be adjusted. But the nice part is Ally will tell you how to fix it. So maybe I inserted a picture, but there's no alt text. So an e-reader wouldn't, wouldn't know that there's an image there. So uh, it'll tell me just to add alt text and to mark it either as a decorative image, or maybe it's an important chart for my class and I can type a description so that students know what it is. Okay, you may see um, the ally indicator in other places in your course and you, maybe you don't know what it is. So again, this is just a screenshot that I took. Um, so I had uploaded a course completion certificate. It was a PDF file, uh, but according to the ally indicator, it, it's not uh, very accessible by e-reader devices. And so that's why it's kind of giving me that red meter. So I could click on that and it would just tell me how, how maybe I could improve it. I love knowing that I can actually physically change my course for my students. And these are my Word document tips. So in the past, and, and I still do it sometimes, you know, I use colored font, I'll bold something, I'll underline it. Um, but again, knowing that they're not accessible by e-reader devices, I don't want to rely solely on it. So if you're in your Microsoft Word document at the top, you might kind of see some headings there. And there's even a little drop down menu. So it gives you even more options. So if I mark something as the title of my, my document, and then I use that option at the top of my Word document. If somebody's using an e-reader device, it will tell them title, and then it'll read off the title of the, the document. So that's kind of exciting. And I know we've got about 10 minutes left. So um, this one, I apologize. I know it's a little bit small, so I'm just going to send you the link to this. Um, but this is more about the Universal Design for Learning guidelines. And I will be happy to send you um, a whole list of different resources. But this just helps us figure out you know, how we can help our students become strategic and goal-directed, um, resourceful and knowledgeable, um, purposeful and motivated. And so they have these tabs that you can click on for more additional information. And this is from the, the CAST organization. They're, they're accredited with coming up with the Universal Design for Learning guidelines. So I know it's a little bit bulky to look at, and, and it's hard to see on this particular screen, um, but it's going to give you some specific strategies. So I do really like how they have things in there like language and symbols. We don't assume necessarily that our students are using the same vocabulary as us. Um, and so they, they give you suggestions for how you can clarify your expectations so that your students are, are on the same page as you. So I think we've got about nine, eight or nine minutes left. I'm open for any questions, comments. Otherwise, I can give you back a couple minutes of your day. And I'll be sure to send out all of the, the resources in a follow-up email. But if I don't hear from you, I hope everybody has a wonderful holiday break. I know you've earned it. Welcome. Happy holidays to you as well.